Well, good morning. This morning, we are going to be talking about living in Christ. We're starting a new series today. And by way of introduction, my name is Tim Hooksema. I'm serving here at Lakeside as the interim pastor for the coming months until you find your next lead pastor. And I know that God has the right person at exactly the right time. Now, we don't know all the details. We don't know when and where and how and who, but God does. And so he will lead the right man here at the right time. And I have full confidence that he'll do that because God has done that in the last two churches that I've served as an interim pastor. So if you're visiting today, maybe you're new to this congregation, so am I. So we're in the same boat. It's my second Sunday here, and I am so thankful to be here. And I believe that it is so very vital that we learn to live in Christ. Every single one of us are shaped by something. And every single one of us are guided by something that we live in. Or maybe that lives in us. And my hope and prayer is as we go through the next seven weeks that what God does in our hearts is he transforms us by his grace and that allows us to live a different, radically different life, a life living, live, living in Christ, not just living out of what we want, not just living out of our own needs, our own wants, our own desires, but saying, you know what? I'm going to let God and his word shape how I live my everyday life. And as that happens, um, It's amazing what God does through his church as we just are freed up to be who we are in Christ and he does a work that will amaze us uh, because it's far better than we we could ever ask for or imagine. The reality, though, is um, many of us walk through our everyday life and we're not being shaped by the word of God. We're not being shaped by Christ. We're being shaped by other things. And I'm no different than you. We're all in this same boat where we struggle to find our identity. Sometimes we find our identity, value, and worth in what we do instead of who has made us. And since we're created in the image of God, God gets to tell us who we are and how we should function, how we should live. And he reveals that in his word. And I'm so thankful that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians It's one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. And we're going to go through um, a few few things here just to kind of introduce what we're going to be talking about. I love history. I love hearing stories of what God has done. And I love biblical history especially. So looking at this word history, first of all, there's this guy and his name used to be Saul And then he's referred to as Paul in the Bible. And we see this radical radical transformation happen in Acts chapter 9, where Saul is on the road to Damascus to continue persecuting Christians. And on that road to Damascus, he had an encounter with God that radically changed his life. And he was wrecked by the grace of God to the point where it caused him to say, you know what? Not only has my heart changed, I want to be a tool used by God to go impact and make disciples. And some of us in this room might say, you know what, the sins of my past, that's going to keep me from being effective for God into the future. That's not the case. Look at Paul. Paul, um, Paul was the coat rack at the stoning of Stephen. He was actually the, holding the coats so that those men that stoned Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian faith, so that, because you can't throw when you have a big heavy coat or a robe on. So Paul, he didn't throw the stones, but he did hold the coats. And he witnessed the murder of Stephen. And he was a persecutor of Christians. He changed from being a persecutor of Christians to a disciple maker. And there was a man named Uh, Barnabas who discipled Paul and then Paul went in in turn discipled many many people and not only that 
we're, we're aware in church history that Paul planted at least 14 churches. So going and being you know, from a Pharisee that was persecuting Christians, Christ followers, to being a man who discipled many and planted at least 14 churches in his 32 years of ministry, that's an amazing transformation. And Paul, one of the churches that he helped plant was in the city of Ephesus. And he spent two and a half to three years helping get this church established. And as it became established, um, Paul had to go to other locations. And Paul ended up in Rome, in prison for his faith. And he ended up writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. And it's the book that we know in the Bible as Ephesians. And this book is one of my favorite books because it clearly lays out a plan that God has for us as followers of Jesus Christ. But there are two problems that we all face when we encounter this book and two problems that the Christians in Ephesus also faced. One of the problems is a problem um, that I'm going to call the problem of dualism. Uh, In this case, dualism is living like there is a heavenly realm and an earthly realm and the two function independently from, from each other. This thinking allows people to compartmentalize their living. So there's a heavenly realm and an earthly realm. And this heavenly realm never in our minds impacts our everyday life. And our everyday life never impacts or interacts with the heavenly realm. And the Bible speaks of the heavenly realm and earthly realm in the book of Ephesians. And it says that the heavenly realm does indeed impact our everyday life, both for good, but also for bad. There is a spiritual battle going on in the world we live in, and spiritual forces of evil are making an impact into our everyday life. And some of us will compartmentalize our Christian faith and we'll say, you know, it's Sunday morning, I'm going to live out of my faith, but the rest of the week, my faith doesn't impact my everyday life. That's the exact same battle that the people at the church in Ephesus were dealing with. They were dealing with this issue that their their Sunday morning faith didn't impact how they lived their everyday life. So they saw it as two separate things, never intertwining. But the reality is Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy what God has created. Satan can't create anything new all he can do is distort what God has created. And distort he does. All you need to do is look at the world around us. God created all kinds of things to be beautiful and to give life. And Satan distorts those for his own personal gain. And the reality is we live in a spiritual battle. At the end of Ephesians, we're going we're gonna to hear that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is what Ephesians 6 says. So the first problem is this problem of dualism. And sometimes in our culture, we battle this same problem where we think, you know what? Satan doesn't really impact my everyday life. But if, we're, if we don't think the heavenly realm impacts our everyday life, we're also cutting out the impact that the gospel of Jesus Christ can have in our everyday life because the spiritual forces of evil are at battle with the spiritual forces of good and God wants to do his redeeming work in and through his church. That's exactly what he wants to do. So the next problem is um, a struggle with what our spiritual battle really is. Uh, We must first know our struggle is not with people, though it may seem like it. These daily battles we face are spiritual in nature and impact our everyday lives and attack our relationships. We cannot fight these battles on our own. We need Jesus and the power of his gospel to do so. So all of us are facing battles in our everyday life. And I bet that when you face a battle, you think you're battling your husband. Or you think you're battling your wife. 
or you think you're battling your mom or your dad, or you think you're battling you know, those in authority over you at work, and we think it's the people that we're struggling against, but the struggle is not against the people. Ephesians 6 tells us that the struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And as we uh, look at these two battles, or the, these two problems, I just want to clarify why we're talking about living in Christ. And the purpose of this series is that we, are tr- that we would be transformed by the power of the gospel for the purpose of the gospel. Our identity, value, and worth does not come, or our identity, value, and worth come from who we are in Christ. From this identity, we get to join God's redemptive mission. And that's what I'm hoping we aim towards, that we're, we're being radically transformed day by day, and that through us, God would do his redeeming work in, in us and through us from that point on. So we're going to quickly take a very quick overview of the book of Ephesians We're going to just take a verse, a key verse from each chapter and talk about what it is that God is doing through this book. First of all, most of us start with a problem and then we try to come up with the solution. God, in all of his wisdom, he knew that we were going to have this problem in chapter 6. And in his wisdom, he gave us a plan to counteract the problem we're going to see later on. And the plan that he gave us is not our plan, it's his plan, it's God's plan. So Ephesians 1.10 says, um, as the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So God starts with a plan. God has a plan to counteract the spiritual battles that we're all in. And actually, it's quite comforting. Next week, we're going to be taking apart chapter 1. And we're going to say, okay, God, we want to learn more about what your plan is about. Because you know what? God's plan is so much better than our plans. I don't know if you've ever picked up on that. Sometimes I think, wow, I developed a brilliant plan for solving this problem. It usually is not a brilliant plan. You can ask my wife. I, I try to come up with a plan to solve a problem in our household or in our family or just in my own life personally. Uh, usually I make things worse and instead of a better. So God in his wisdom gave us a plan. But not only did he give us a plan, um, God has a people. In Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God gives us a plan, and then he says, you know what? I want to work my plan through my people, so I need a people. In the Old Testament, God's people were the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, it's us. It's the church. We're his people. And he created us as masterpieces as a piece of workmanship, as a piece of art, so that he could live through us. He wants us to walk in that way. And chapter 3 talks about the reality that God wants to work his plan through his people. God has this amazing plan to unite all things in him, and he wants to work that in and through us, his church. So in Ephesians 3.10 it says, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In a sense, what God is saying is, I want my plan to be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is speaking of Satan and his demons. He's saying, you know what? I want the plan to be known to them and to the whole world that my plan is going to work through my people. So God has a plan to redeem people, and his plan is to use us. Now, I often say that if I were God, and I'm not, it's a good thing. 
if, if I were God, I would not choose broken. I would have not chosen broken people to work my redeeming plan through. I would have chosen another path. But God chose us. Every single one of us are broken because of sin, but we don't, we don't have to be broken without hope. We can have a great hope in Jesus Christ who wants to do his redeeming work in us and through us. He wants to carry out his plan through his people. Chapter 4 in our family, we call this the better, better together chapter. In the world, it sa- the world kind of says, like-minded people need to flow together. Like, uh, like-minded people, like people of uh, socioeconomical situations, like pe- people that like the same things, people that have the same passions, they need to flow together. We're going to learn in a few weeks in chapter 4 that though we are very different, we're different for a purpose. God gave each one of us different gifts. And in Ephesians 4, there's a a key verse, Ephesians 4.15, rather speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So Christ is the head of his church, And if you look around this room, we're all so different. And that's on purpose. God knew that if we were all the same, we wouldn't function as the body. If we were all a hand, we wouldn't be a full body. He made us different on on purpose. So if you're different than your spouse or different than those in your family, God knew you needed someone to be different than you. My wife and I could not be more different. My wife, Jenny, grew up in a family that's more feeling-oriented. And that's very intriguing to me because I don't understand feelings all that well. Uh, So a common question around their dinner table would have been, so how do you feel about how your day went? Or how are you feeling right now? That question was never asked in my house. In my house, we always talked about so what are you thinking about, or what have you been thinking about, or what would you like to talk about, about what you're thinking? And so I have a hard time identifying my own feelings, and God gave me the blessed gift of Jenny, who is helping me understand feelings. And God gave me to her to help her understand that sometimes we need to think through things too. We shouldn't live just by our feelings. And, and it's so beneficial. So the world would say, wow, you guys are opposite. You don't belong together at all. You're not compatible. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the wisdom of God says, I created you to be different on purpose and you're better together. And actually, the words better together, uh, those, those are words that we use to describe our marriage. The word together was a word we chose to mark our marriage for the rest of our life. Uh, we chose that word about a week before we were, we were married, and that was 23 and a half years ago. And so we are truly better together, and we're learning more about that each and every day. So I hope that as we go through the Better Together chapter in a few weeks, that you see people that are different than you as valuable. A lot of us think, you know what, if everyone was just more like me, wouldn't the world be better? Like... Doesn't that just make sense? Because we have it all figured out. And so if everyone just saw life like I did, then we'd be great. Honestly, we wouldn't be that much better off. We'd be far worse off. Because if everyone saw everything the same, we wouldn't be able to look at life from multiple different vantage points and angles. So God gave us differences for our good, even within the church. That's a very, very important understanding we're going to come to. Oh, chapter 5. Um, this is the week you'll maybe want to skip um, church and just not come um, because it is brutally painful. We call it in our family the flashlight chapter. Um, and the reason we call it the flashlight chapter, this is the chapter that God shines his light on our sinful life And you'd go, what kind of a loving God would shine a light and reveal our sin to us? I don't want that. That's why I said skip it. Because it's it's painful. 
when the Holy Spirit reveals to us our sin. But honestly, there is no better place to be. I honestly hope everyone shows up, and I hope you bring friends. Um, it's a brutal week, but it's going to be a great week because one of the most loving things God could ever do is reveal our sin to us so that we know our desperate need for Jesus. It's a painful understanding, but this key verse here uh, says, uh, for, anything that became, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know what? Some of us are sleepers. In our Christian faith, we're walking through life, and we're just half asleep. We're almost comatose in our existence as followers of Jesus Christ. And the reality is when the light of Christ shines on us, it wakes you up. The other night, um, I was tossing and turning, not sleeping real good. And my son was on a sleepover at a friend's house. So my wife went and slept in our son's bed because I was like all over the place. I have restless leg syndrome, so that causes a problem. And so she went and slept in his bed. But his alarm clock, the light on it was shining on her and to the point where it was keeping her awake. So she covered it with his baby blanket um, because... That was the closest thing she could find. She covered that light up because light wakes up sleepers. In this verse, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ, and Christ will shine on you, or the light of Christ will shine on you. It's painful when the light of Christ shines on us, but it's so good. There are sometimes things that are painful, but they're good, like exercise. Um, painful, like I don't want to head off to the Y in the morning, but I usually do. Once I get there, it's fine. It's the getting there that's hard because I don't like pain. There's good pain and there's bad pain. And the pain that we experience when the Holy Spirit reveals our sin to us, there is pain involved. We need to be honest about that. But the reality is it's a good pain because it's God bringing to the surface the sin that's keeping us from being all that we need to be in Christ. And the hope and prayer there, um, when we hit that chapter, is that God will reveal our sin to us, but that we won't wallow in our sin or stay there, but, that, but rather what we would do is we'd say, you know what, God, thank you for revealing my sin. Thank you for revealing that I don't have it all together. Thank you for revealing my desperate need for Jesus. And we don't need to wallow in our sin or be without hope because Jesus died that we might have life in him. Apart from him, we don't have life. But in him, we have, we have life. So that's one of my favorite chapters um, in the entire Bible. I personally don't like it because it's painful but I love it because it is God at work. In there, he talks about husbands and wives, our relationships to one another. Because that's a relationship. We think our struggle is with our husband or our wife, and our struggle is really against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that are trying to distort our marriages. It goes on to talk about our relationship with our children and it goes on to talk after talking about relationships with our children. It goes on to talk about relationships with masters and servants. Uh, we can liken that to kind of our work environment. And I bet that most of us spend a majority of our time either with our husband and wife, husband or wife, our children, or the people we work with. So those are where we, where we need the most help. That's right where we need the gospel in our everyday life. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against spiritual forces of evil. And we're going to go on into chapter 6 in a few weeks. And it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. 
when we encounter the struggles that we face in this world and we can stand firm and have great peace, it's a beautiful thing. When we realize that our identity, value, and worth doesn't come from what we do, but who we are in Christ, we can walk through the chaos of life with peace and rest and hope in the gospel. And I know that we all want that. I know if we went around this room, I bet our lives are in chaos. Because if your life is anything like mine, it's in chaos. And if we live based on what's going on in our life, we feel chaotic. We feel stressed. And we take that out on others. Yesterday, my daughter played a basketball game uh, against a college team. Um, she's at Judson University in Elgin, Illinois. And we went down to a game in Calumet, uh, Calumet College in Hammond, Indiana yesterday. And this team has not won a conference game this year. So this team from Calumet County, College is, they're, they're angry. <laughs> they don't want to show up to practice. They're angry in the game. Uh, one girl got a flagrant foul for taking out one of our players and almost injuring her um, and ending her season. It was nasty. Because when we, are, when we live and our identity is shaped by what we do and we're not winning the game, we feel angry. We feel frustrated. We feel mad. So my hope and prayer is that we're not living out of our identity based on what we do or what, we, what has been done to us out in the world, but we're allowing God and his, work, his word to speak truth into our life so that we're ready for these spiritual battles, so that when we encounter the spiritual battles in our everyday life, we see them as a spiritual battle. We say, you know what? The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms are trying to invade my life. What do I do? And the gospel of Jesus Christ responds to that battle in a powerful way. The, the flashlight chapter reveals our mess in that and re reveals that we need Jesus in the midst of our everyday battles. And I hope that we understand that our battle isn't with one another. I've been in many church uh, church like membership meetings and you'd think that the battle is with the other members it gets downright nasty and that's not a healthy thing our battle is not against flesh and blood our battle is certainly against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms so my hope and prayer for the coming uh the, the remaining six weeks is that we would be rested that we would be calm and that we would be at peace as we hear who God has made us to be. This phrase, in him or in Christ, shows up throughout the six chapters, primarily in the early first three chapters. You see, in him, in him, in him. When we realize that we are living our everyday life in his power, it radically transforms how we live our everyday lives and it radically transforms how God wants to do his work in us and through us. Like I said, that flashlight chapter, it's not comforting, but it's oh so good because it reveals our own sin nature and it reveals our desperate need for a loving God who bestows his mercy and grace upon us and that is exactly what he wants us to do. So to end this morning, I have some questions that I would like all of us to ponder for a, a little bit here. So we're going to just pause, um, and I'll read through these questions. And I just want you to think about them. Maybe jot them down as notes. How does dualistic thinking affect you and the people you know? Once again, that dualistic thinking is thinking that the spiritual forces of evil in, or the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms don't impact my everyday life, that they're two separate things. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you think you've compartmentalized your faith. Maybe you, you say, right now I'm in a church, so that's, I'm, that's heavenly realm stuff. And tomorrow when I go to work, that's earthly realm stuff. 
Jesus came that the heavenly realm of his kingdom could infiltrate our everyday lives and do battle with the spiritual forces of evil. So if that's you today, I want you to consciously think, am I compartmentalizing my faith? Do I say I'm doing churchy stuff on Sunday and I'm doing normal everyday stuff? My hope and prayer there is that the work of God in your heart and in your life leaks into your everyday life. Because everyday faith is, is what we're called to live out. Secondly, uh, do you see the spiritual battles that are happening in your everyday life? And first of all, do you see them as spiritual battles, not as battles with people? Like I said, a lot of husbands, you think your worst problem is your wife. If you just had a different wife, life would be great. No. No, that's the wrong answer. The, wrong, the, the right answer is to say, God, you gave me my wife. You knew in your wisdom that she needed to be my wife. You know that this is for my good, that she's different than me. Reveal what you want to do in our marriage. And, you know, kids, sometimes you're like, I was born into the wrong family. If I, if I, could, just, if I could have picked my mom and dad, I would have picked someone else. God knew exactly who the family you needed, who he was placing you with. God made all those choices. God in his wisdom gives us what we need, not what we want. And lastly, uh, do you see evidence of God's grace in your everyday life? God is at work carrying out his plan that we talked about in chapter 1. This plan to redeem all things back to himself by the power of the gospel, through the power of the gospel. His plan is so much better than our plan. And there is evidence that God is at work all over the place. I'm convinced that most of us don't see half of what God is doing. When I was five years old, um, about this time every year, I would get horribly sick and sometimes end up in the hospital because I'd be unable to breathe. But also, sometimes I would just get the, like those eye crusties, like my eyes would crust shut at night. Um, and when I was a little kid, I called them eye boogies because they were like boogers in your eyes. And, and so my eye boogies would crust shut so much so that I couldn't see where I was going. And I would try to find my mom who could help me. And so the first time this happened, I stood up out of bed and I walked straight into a wall because I couldn't see. And I said, Mom! And my mom came and she's a loving mom, so she got a very warm washcloth and wiped my eyes so I could see clearly. Many of us, I think, have spiritual eye boogies. Um, we don't see that God is alive nowadays, that God is alive and active in our everyday life, that God is doing his redeeming work through his church. All we see are the problems, like running into a wall. We don't see that our faithful God is carrying out his redeeming work in and through his church. We fail to understand that, fail to see what God is doing. And the reality is God is working. I believe thousands of times a day, and we miss it. And a ministry that I lead, we call it Everyday Gospel, because we want the gospel to impact our everyday life. And every Sunday night, tonight being no exception, we start it the exact same way. We start it by having a time where we, we call it evidences of God's grace. And we say, you know, how have you been seeing God do his redeeming work in and through his church this past week? And then we share stories. And it's amazing what God does as we share stories. As we get in the habit of sharing what we see God doing, it encourages us, first of all, that God's alive. Secondly, that he is active in our everyday life. And thirdly, that he's using everyday ordinary people to do his work through. When we gather together, 
Sometimes we have little kids present in our meeting, and there's this one little girl, Emma. She's five years old, and one time about a year ago, she shared. She said, I, I have an evidence of God's grace. I said, okay, go ahead, Emma. And Emma, she said, well, we went to my grandma's house, and my grandma's house is a mess. Okay, I failed to see the evidence of God's grace. Um, and she said, but, I, and my mom said, you know, Emma, can you help me clean grandma's house? And Emma said, uh, no, I don't want to clean grandma's house. It's a mess. And, and Emma said, how I saw God at work is I prayed to God that God would give me a heart, a right heart to clean my grandma's house. And God did that. And he, she said, I prayed right then and there, right as this conversation was happening, and God changed her heart. And she said, it was so much fun to serve God and like, help my grandma out. Like, I didn't think that it would be fun, but God did that. And she, she, it wasn't her, it wasn't little Emma that made this change in her heart. It was God, by his grace. And she saw that as God's work in her own life. So she shared that. With the group and everyone, you know, we have, we have ministry leaders in this meeting and they're like, oh my goodness. Like, if, if I were going through a struggle and I just prayed, you know, God, change my heart. Wouldn't that be good if church leaders did that too, not just five-year-old Emmas? That would be amazing. And so people were saying, Emma, thank you for leading us. Thank you for showing us what it means to walk in humility and ask God to change our hearts. So I hope you ponder these questions um, as you go into this coming week, and I hope that you look for evidence of God's grace in your life. Because in the coming weeks, um, we're going to start uh, videotaping stories of evidences of God's grace, and um, we may use them on Sunday mornings as a way to show that our faithful God is at work here in Algoma and in the surrounding communities. Because God is alive and active. There's no doubt in my mind. I'm going to close this in prayer and we'll continue to worship our Lord. Oh dear Lord, we thank you for leading us and guiding us. Lord, I thank you that you have given us a plan. And Lord, your plan has started since the, before the foundations of the world. Lord, you gave, you, you gave your plan Lord, and you decide to use us, your people, to carry out your redeeming work in this world. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to do that with grace and humility. Lord, I pray that we would go in the power of your gospel, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that as we look around and we see that people are different than us, Lord, that you created that on purpose. Lord, that we would see people that are different than us as valuable and worthwhile in your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that as you shine your light into our hearts and reveal our sin, Lord, that we wouldn't feel condemned, but Lord, that we would be convicted by your Holy Spirit that we need Jesus. And Lord, I pray uh, that in the end, we would realize that you have equipped us for the spiritual battles that we will face. Lord, that you are alive in us and that you desire to do your work in and through us and not only in and through us, Lord, you desire to do your work to affect this whole region, to affect this whole state, our whole country and the world. Lord, I pray that you would do that by your power and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.